One life is all we have, and we live it as we believe in living it. But to sacrifice what you are, and to live without belief, that is a faith more terrible than dying. St. Joan of Arc, Patron Saint of Soldiers and Captives Girls Night It's amazingly how unfair the world is. Some people are capable of flying around without a care or running at supersonic speeds, while others couldn't even walk. Some people can lift freight trains over their heads, and others have to struggle just to push their own body off the ground. Some people are able to fill their day with purpose and excitement, and others, like me, have to spend their days being lectured about the most boring topics known to man. So in total, there are eight mundane blood type combinations out of the three androgen types. Miss Turner finished the most basic layout of the subject. She called on someone who must have had their hand up. Question? Yes? Yeah, my blood is registered as MOB negative, and I've also seen a lot of other letters and blood types. It was the large boy who sat on the next row two seats behind me. Yes, Mr. Large, Miss Turner answered. As I said, there are eight mundane types, but there are many more odd types. The M stands for mutant, and the O is not an O, it's a zero. It is an unfortunate effect of our mutant demi-type that our blood is more complex. These complications are listed out as numbers. Mine, for example, is M8AB negative, the highest mutant type so far. Does anyone want to guess how blood transfusions work among these types? The class was silent as they thought. Guess they didn't know. They were probably thinking that the numbers could give to the numbers either higher or lower. And it was the boy in the front corner who gave that very guess. Would it make either you or Simi the universal donor for mutants? A very intelligent guess, Mr. Starr, but completely wrong. Miss Tudor praised him before calling on another student. Mr. York, would you like to take a guess? It wouldn't be a guess, ma'am. I am very aware of the relationship between the mutant blood types, as I am lucky enough to have the M2 type paired with my AB positive. I didn't recognize the voice, but it sounded like he knew everything and enjoyed it. This makes me the universal receptive among mutants. A hint to everyone else, also to my fortune, Simi's type 0 is the universal donor. This didn't help him at all. The class was confused, and everyone seemed to be stumped. Even Mary, who herself was a mutant, didn't know. Miss Turner allowed the class to wonder a bit more before deciding to call on one more student. You there, desk number three. I don't see any notes on your desk. Can I assume you already know the answer? Yes, ma'am, I said as flatly as I could. I do know the answer. Miss Turner didn't say anything. She stood there until prompting, Can you provide your answer to the class? If so, then please do. I sighed. First, the numbers are listed in the order they were discovered, with only the first three being listed in the order of valid transfusions. The rest are seemingly random, like how type 8 can take from type 5 and freely swap between type 6, but neither can be given to type 5. There is no known explanation for this. Well then, I'm impressed. Miss Turner checked the roster. Jessica Black? Studying medicine, are we? I'm not. No clue about you. I kept my eyes locked to the wall as the class fell silent. All right, then. Let's move on. Miss Turner broke the silence and continued the class. More boring stuff doled out as if it wasn't common knowledge. Then again, it wasn't that common for these people. People not like me. Unfortunately, I was stuck here until two. The bell rang, and Miss Turner was replaced by Mr. Meerman. The contrast between all the teachers was salient. Mrs. Turner's plain clothes blouses were the most dull next to Mr. Meerman's trench coat that always seemed just open enough to barely show the firearms underneath. Mr. Hall dressed like a corporate CEO and taught math like one, too. Of course, they all paled in comparison to Galacto, who wore only black sweats had a yellow scarf, a minimalist design that made him recognizable across the world. Sweet mercy, I was bored. So bored I started thinking of my own outfit, the black-on-black-on-black -on -black layers I wore, 
I twisted the ring on my left ring finger. The silver and emeralds of my jewelry broke the all-black pattern. But I wasn't going to drop them. They did match my eyes. I wondered if the school provided different colors of the uniform. The actual khaki uniform was optional, so why not have multiple shades? Miss Black, what do you think? Mr. Meerman called, breaking my thoughts. About what? I asked, keeping my eyes on the wall. About the poem, Mr. Meerman slammed a book closed. The one we've been talking about? I think it's pointless, ironic since the poem itself is about pointlessness, I answered. How do you figure? Each time Robert Frost describes one of the past, he turns and describes the other in a similar way. The ending is a delusional declaration of the meaning in his choice. I explained the text of The Road Not Taken. I knew what he was covering, even if I wasn't, even if I was trying to not listen. Mr. Meerman sniffed and stayed silent for a moment. Well, that's quite the advanced reading. I'm impressed. She's right, you know. If we return to the second verse, I returned to my own thoughts, which were disappointing when I remembered I was thinking about fashion. I wore this outfit because I didn't care how others looked at me anymore, and yet I was starting to wonder how to care even less. I was so bored, I was caring about not caring. The irony was almost funny, and I hated it. Soon lunch came. I didn't go. Instead, I slipped out to the field yard and sat in the same shadow I had been sitting in all week, blocking out the pangs from my stomach. One of the few useful talents I've developed. I still needed to eat, but I could always do that later. Other students would also come down to the field yard, but everyone here had the understanding that we all wanted to be alone, even if we had to do it together. Eventually, the hour ended. We all made our ways without word to our classes to finally end the day. Mr. Galacto made his announcements and wished us all well before we were freed. I immediately started to the front door. Hopefully, I could enjoy some time alone before my boarding mates ruined the rest of my day. Of course, some things are just not meant to be. Wait! Jessica! Jessica Black! I heard the short blonde girl who sat behind me call out. I looked to see her weaving through the halls wearing the school's uniform with the skirt bottom. On it, dangling off the left pocket, was the silver crucifix she had worn every day. She breathed heavily as she stopped and asked, Where are you going? Why do you care? I was not happy being denied what limited time I had. Because I wanted to see if you wanted to go to class together. I'm not enrolled in any additional classes. That's fine. You don't have to actually enroll to go to them. She grinned at me. You just won't get credit. So why would I go to a class without credit? I snarked. Well, the teachers can make exceptions. She stumbled over her words. If you impress them enough, they can grant full credit. I see, I said before turning and walking on. Well, I'm leaving. Wait, don't you want to? No, I don't. But it's super fun and... I said no. But I know you'll like it. How? I laughed and turned to her. What can possibly make you think I would like spending more time in a classroom? Because of what you said in class, she stepped in front of me. About the road not taken? Mr. Meerman said himself that your reading was impressive. So what? Why does that matter? Because the class I want to take with you is interpretation of greater text. You would love it. <laughs> Why? Because I can see delusions inside of delusions? The road not taken. There's no such thing as a road not taken. A road not taken is just a clearing. I was nearly out of patience. She didn't respond. Her face drooped before she gathered her will with a deep breath. She put a hand forward to me. I'm sorry. Let's start over. My name is... I know what your name is. I cut her off. I've heard it every day in class, remember? Oh, yeah. You know, I think it's funny how we have the same name. Jessica Black? Jessica Blanc? Jessica Blanc tried to laugh. She pronounced her name with the French accent of its origin. Jessica is a common name, I pointed out to her. Yeah, but then our last names. It's quite the coincidence. They happen. I'm leaving now. 
I stepped around her and started again. Wait! she cried out. I stopped again but didn't turn. She took the opportunity. I'm sorry if I'm bothering you, but I just... I just thought we could be friends. I sighed deeply. I was so done. I didn't want to be friends with her or anyone. I wanted to be alone. I wasn't like her, the others. I wasn't gifted. I was cursed. She wouldn't understand. But I could tell she also wouldn't give up. So I gave up and turned to her. Fine. Yippee! She leaped with joy, drawing the eyes of the few other students passing by. She grabbed my hand and pulled. I knew you would come. This way. I didn't put up any resistance to her meager pull. As we returned the way we came and ended just one door down from our own homeroom. Class 09I was posted on the door we entered. There stood Mr. Meerman. He looked to the open door and saw us. Miss Blanc, you're late. Just because this is an extra class does not mean you can shrug it off, Mr. Meerman lectured her. Yes, sir, I apologize. It's just I had to grab my friend. Jessica Blanc stepped in and started down one of the rows with me in tow. I see. Miss Black, I thought you didn't have any extra classes. I don't, I said back as I took the seat next to Jessica Blanc. Hmm, yes. Well, we were finishing a reading from Phyllis Wheatley. Does anybody have any notes? Mr. Meerman scanned the class. Anyone? The class didn't seem to have much to say. They looked over the poem they assumedly just read. One student raised a hand and offered, Slavery is wrong? Yes, that's a good reading, Mr. Meerman gave flat praise. Slavery, in the vast majority of situations, is bad, especially when paired with the inhumane treatment that chattel slavery brought. Many writers throughout time have addressed this, but nearly all of those writings were mundane humans talking about the enslavement of the mundane. What is one way to interpret this fact? You do not have to give your own opinion on the matter. In fact, a viewpoint you disagree with would be better. Anyone? The class was silent again as they thought it over in their head. They looked over the writing and whispered their thoughts to one another. Finally, a student ventured a guess. Uh, is it because there were only mundane slaves? How do you figure that? Meerman prompted them to continue. Well, how could you write about something that doesn't exist? Nonfiction writing, I mean. You're saying demi-humans were never enslaved? Yeah, I guess. I mean, how could they enslave us? We would just break free. That's a nice train of thought, Mr. Tartar. But it's wrong. Not only have demi-humans been enslaved without history, but many of us have been considered incredibly valuable. And while it is true that many of us could easily break free of physical restraints, there are more things that kept people from breaking free. Family is a popular one. Can anyone provide another reading? Um, they didn't believe demi-humans deserved freedom? Came another student's voice. Mr. Meerman snapped his finger. That's what I'm looking for. Can you expand on that, Mr. Laskers? Oh, um, they thought that because we were different, we weren't entitled to rights? That's a rather baseline reading. Differences were used to justify many an atrocity. But with only a slight changing of different to superior, we could begin looking at a great number of past readings made by demi-humans. To put simply, many in the last two centuries have stated openly that mundanes are naturally inclined to believe that anyone not mundane should be lowered in social standing. This caused a lot of animosity between the two groups to cycle through time. However, this is also an incomplete reading, just like Mr. Tartar's reading. It comes from a misunderstanding of the facts of history. Can anyone provide another reading? Miss Black, I'm sure you can impress me. I had been sitting quietly listening. The subject was still dull, but it was interesting to hear others' thoughts. Of course, I already knew many interpretations and how they often formed. Another way to read the text isn't that they believed demi-humans were lesser or greater, or even different, but rather they didn't think of them at all. The term demi-human is attributed to Benjamin Franklin and didn't appear in law until the 1800s. 
well after Franklin's death, even though he advocated for demi-human rights in the last years of his life. Therefore, it's more likely that when the many writers of the past call for the freedom of their people, that it was assumed that demi-humans within that people are included in that call. In fact, many of the texts used by groups such as the Brotherhood of Mutants to rally support were used in many court cases such as Hamilton v. Georgia. Simon Meerman gave a clap. Well done. Incredible. What Jessica has pointed out is something you should always keep in mind when making a reading of any kind. That ultimately, your reading of a text will be incomplete simply because the writing of the text itself is incomplete. No one person can have knowledge of everything at all time, and all knowledge is shaped by the time it is known in. Robert said demi-human slavery didn't exist, and in one way is correct. Demi-humans were not enslaved because demi-humans did not exist back then, only regular humans with superhuman abilities. To put it concisely, understanding is not enough. One must understand the understanding, and in turn, understand that. That was concisely? A student mumbled. Know this. You will never be done studying the world. Education has no end. Only breaks. Now, let's move to another example of, of this lack of distinction from an ancient text of Greece. The class continued on. Mr. Meerman read a poem or essay, and then asked for the class to make their own interpretation. He rarely called on me, which I appreciated because I didn't raise my hand. But when he did, I always gave my best description of the text and its origins. This went on for the two hours assigned to the class. Near the end of the class was when it mattered. Mr. Meerman read a poem from a medieval poet and asked the class for their reading, calling on one of them. Yes, Miss Anderson. How do you read this? Um, actually, Anderson said. I wanted to ask, what year was that poem written in? Mr. Meerman closed the book in his hand and sighed. And with that, I deem this lesson a success. You all pass. The purpose of this lesson has been completed. And what was that? Robert Tartar asked. What do you think it was? Meerman countered. I don't know. All she did was ask a question. Exactly. Simply giving your thoughts is a noble goal. But only by asking questions and seeking the answers to those questions are we capable of learning. Now, I do apologize, but this is where we must end the day, Mr. Meerman said just before the bell rang. I'm very proud of all of you, and I'm expecting much more from you all. Miss Black, a word? I was just about to leave when Mr. Meerman called me over. Jessica Blanc had just stepped out and was waiting just outside the door. I looked to him with a cautious expression. I just want to talk, Mr. Meerman said. About, I asked, about your studies. You have my records. Yes, I do have the writings of your files, but I believe we covered the flaws of simply reading the text. Will you please have a conversation with me? Miss Blanc may join us if you like. We'll be late for our next class, I stated. I don't have another class today, Jessica Blanc stated in turn. I slowly turned my gaze to the blonde. Sorry. It won't be long. I have another class soon, after all, Mr. Meerman said. We stepped back and closed the door behind us, taking seats in the front as Mr. Meerman gestured to us. I started. What do you want to know? First off, how well have you enjoyed your previous studies? Why do you care? Miss Black, I am the teacher here. I am the one who gives questions the questions. So please answer mine. I sighed. Well enough. And you, Miss Blanc? You may participate. Oh, I enjoyed my time in school, she answered without hesitation. I went to the College St. Joan in France before coming here. You're from France? I raised an eyebrow. I am. I was actually born in Louisiana, though. But my family moved when I was only three. And you, Miss Black? Where are you from? Mr. Meerman asked. I crossed my arms. The Union. Which state? Does it matter? Again, I'm the teacher here. I sighed. New York. Wow! Jessica Blanc exclaimed. I heard New York City is one of the biggest cities in the United States. Don't they also have schools for demi-humans? Doesn't France? I asked sharply. Oh, they do, she said quietly. 
Well, luckily, we were able to have both of you here at West Progress High, Mr. Meerman said. What are your demi-types, if I may ask? You may not, I said firmly. Um, I'm a divine prophet. I have visions of the future, Blanc answered. Interesting, Mr. Meerman nodded his head. The power of foresight is a heavy burden to bear. It takes great strength to see what is beyond the now. Thank you, Jessica Blanc said, as if she was being complimented. Of course, it takes great strength to see what's beyond the here. Wouldn't you agree, Miss Black? I didn't say anything, and luckily I was impressed too. As the door opened again, and an older student called, Sup, Mr. M. Good afternoon. Please take a seat and wait for class to begin. He stood off the desk, his coat shifting just enough to show a glint of metal underneath. Well, I thank you too. I'll be seeing you two around. He gestured his permission for our departure. We stood and headed out. The hall was filled with movement, but significantly less than the earlier hours. We made our way to the front of the school and exited through the front gate. The mood between us seemed sour, which was fine by me as I marched on with Blanc following right behind. Neither of us said anything about this. After all, we both knew we were heading to the same place. Choosing not to wait for a bus, we marched across the outer limits of the city, arriving at Elizabeth's house for Demi Children, our home. We continued in silence as we arrived at room 313, our room. Opening it, I saw the room was already occupied by two other girls, our boarding mates. Are you two just getting back? Melissa Odinson asked, looking under a comic book as she laid on her bed on the lower right bunk. Did you walk home? We did, Jessica Blanc answered, as I climbed into my bed on the upper left bunk. Well, that explains how we got back first, Jennifer Knight said from one of the four tiny desks in our room. Me and Melissa took the bus. I thought you didn't have extra classes, Melissa said. I could only guess she was addressing me. Of course, I couldn't see her, and I doubted she saw me from her vantage point. I brought her to my interpretation of greater text class, Jessica Blanc sat on her own bed under mine. We had fun. Jessica had fun? That's hilarious, Melissa laughed. We did. Tell them. Jessica Blanc stood up and tried to prompt me, but I had my back to her. See, she doesn't believe in fun, Melissa said, returning to her comic. Melissa, you shouldn't be so mean, Jennifer said from the desk. Jessica is in the same boat as all of us. We're just trying to make it. Speak for yourself. I've already made it. Melissa leaped from her bed and stood in the center of the room, talking as if she wasn't the shortest by a whole head. I made it the day I was born. Everything else is just gravy. I'm just saying, Jessica's going through a lot, Jennifer said. Jessica doesn't need you defending her. She's a big girl like the rest of us, Melissa shot back. Yeah, I... Wait, Jessica Blanc tried to step in. I'm not defending her. I'm just trying to explain that bullying her isn't helping, Jennifer continued past her. Bullying? You think anyone considers me a bully? I'm just being honest, Melissa said back. Both of the girls seemed to have forgotten about me and Blanc. Honesty can still be mean when you're just being a bully, Jennifer said. I'm sorry, time out. Are you talking about me or her? I'm talking about you, Melissa said. I thought all of that was at Jessica Black. Jennifer said. Not all of it. Just the part of her being no fun was at her, Melissa said. Jennifer sighed. We need nicknames. How about just calling them by their last name, Melissa suggested. I don't really like that, Jennifer said, looking at the back of her hand, her skin darkened by African blood. But that's just me. Yeah, I don't really like that either, Blanc agreed. I laughed. I guess honesty doesn't carry cleverness very well. Melissa scowled at that. I know. We'll call you Jessica, and we'll call her bitch. Melissa threw the comic at the top bunk, overshooting it, making it slam onto the wall and fall between the bed to the floor. I know, I know, Jessica Blanc said with an edge of panic. I'll just go by Jessie. Jessica and Jessie. Easy peasy. See? Melissa tisked. Whatever. She threw herself back onto the bed and rolled to face the wall. Jessie sat on her own bed again and sighed, and then looked to Jennifer. What are you studying? Trigonometry, 
I have a class tomorrow. Jennifer answered, lifting the textbook. Oh, that's cool. It's boring, Melissa disagreed. I mean, it's literally just studying triangles. And how they relate to the world, Jennifer added. Whatever. Melissa rolled over and jumped out of bed. I'd rather just experience the world. In fact, let's do that. What? Jessie tilted her head. Let's go somewhere. Do something. Melissa stepped over to their shared closet and pulled the smallest khaki coat. I assume we all have some pocket money. Enough for a few rounds at the arcade. Let's go. But what about... Jessie tried to object but was cut off. But nothing. There's plenty of sun left in the sky. Let's use it. Melissa cried out, pumping her fist to the roof. Maybe a break would be nice, Jennifer said. Yes, Melissa exclaimed her victory before turning to Jessie. You in? You don't even have an excuse. Well, okay, Jessie agreed sheepishly. All right then, come on Jessica, let's go. What? I laughed from my bed. We're going to the arcade, now come on. And you're inviting me? Sure, if you want to put it like that, now come on. I thought you didn't like me. I don't, but I'm not a bitch like you. I'm actually nice. I laughed at that. If you say so, I'm not going. Melissa scowled and climbed the left bunk. Come on, we're classmates and roommates. It won't kill you to actually spend time with us. I'm not going, I stated without mirth. Leave me alone. No, you either come with us or else, Melissa threatened. Or else what? Melissa stared at me with malice. Or I'll tell everyone that your favorite color is pink. My favorite color is pink, I said honestly. It goes well with black. And that you like ballet and dressing like a doll. Go ahead, like anyone cares. And you're boy crazy and write about them in that diary of yours. What? I stiffened, clutching the black book. The book you carry around with all your secrets. I leaped over to Melissa with the black book in hand. This is not a diary, you fool. It is a tome of unimaginable knowledge. This book is the only reason why I'm here. Why I'm even a demi-human. Did I hit a nerve? Melissa smirked. Well then, you better come along. She hopped down, leaving me to climb over the railing. Jessica, you don't have to, Jessie said. It's fine. I'd rather not have to deal with her annoying ass, I said. Whatever, let's go, Melissa said, exiting the room. We made our way through the city, crossing the line between the outer and inner city limits. Buildings grew in the towers and the streets widened. The arcade was a multi-floor section of a building just on the outskirts of the inner city. The word arcade was lit in neon letters over the door. It didn't need anything else. The inside was filled with sound as dozens of children, teenagers, and even a few adults played on different machines. We went up to the counter for game passes and learned our school IDs were valid for that. All right, girls, what's our first target? Melissa stood before the glory of the room. You're the leader here, I commented. Melissa shot me a side-eyed look. Damn right I am. And I say we're taking Maze Master first. She marched into the cluster of game cabinets, all sporting art with their names on it. What are we doing exactly? Jennifer asked as Melissa popped bills into the token machine. We're playing for high scores. I want every box to have our names at the top. Melissa handed out tokens. First Maze Master, then Lore Legend, and then we'll take on the Battle Brawl scores. And after that? Jesse asked. If there's time, then another title shall fall. Simple. Melissa explained. A booming laughter came from just behind a cabinet. The source turned the corner and revealed his massive frame and leather attire. You're going to be here until the end of time if you're going to try to beat me. And who the fuck are you? Melissa faced the boy as if she was the one who was twice the other's size. That's Adrian Priest. Jennifer answered in a whisper. Who? That asshole bully from our class. I added. He thinks he's some hotshot. <laughs> Damn straight, Adrian agreed as he swaggered up to us. And you're delusional if you think you can beat the high score of any of the battle brawlers. 
you're going to have to beat me and my brother. And that ain't happening. Oh, please. I'm amazed you could even figure out which buttons does what. Melissa mocked. Do you even know how to spell your own name? I know how to spell, little bitch. Adrian stepped forward and somehow failed to loom over Melissa. So that's your full name? Little Adrian bitch? Melissa asked with a tone of mock sincerity. Watch it, Adrian balled a fist. You're starting to annoy me. Or would it be Adrian little bitch priest? You're just begging me to kill you, aren't you? Adrian cracked his knuckles with the sound of breaking bones. Or would that be your mama's name? Oh, that's it! Adrian swiped Melissa up by her coat. I'm gonna teach you- Ah! Adrian did not finish his threat as Melissa had just as quickly bitten his hand with all her might, causing him to let go of his grasp. Melissa stumbled but kept her footing as she raised her own fist. Bring it! She cried like she had a chance. And bring it he was ready to do. Adrian shook off the pain and took a single step forward before being interrupted again by a bright beam of light that circled them coming off the ceiling. No violence in the arcade! An intercom boomed over the whole floor. Adrian tisked as he stepped back. This ain't over, girly. Bet on it, Melissa agreed as she threw up a rude gesture. Do you have to pick a fight with everyone bigger than you? I asked. Yes, Melissa said flat out before turning to the rest of us. All right, let's do this. We each took a maze master cabinet and started pushing buttons. Both Jennifer and Jesse needed instructions on how to play, which Melissa provided. I managed fine without help and Melissa herself seemed to have been a master of the game. Soon we moved on to Lore Legend 2, and then to Battle Brawl. To Melissa's dismay, each of the cabinets featuring the dynamic fighting scene had the same two names at the top of them. Ambrose Priest, with Adrian Priest in second. Melissa huffed. Asshole. They tried their best, but none of them could manage to get into the top ten. They eventually all gave up, but I managed to get ninth. Knocking some mook named Carl Starr off. I'm hungry, Melissa whined as we stepped into the setting sun. Who knows a good place to eat, cheap as possible? I think the school does a dinner program, Jennifer offered. Ew, no. I'm not going back to school unless I have to, Melissa shut down the idea. I've heard they have a union deluxe here. Let's go there, but that's like five miles north past the river, Jennifer noted. So you know the way, Melissa said. You can take lead. But it's already so late. Good thing the buses run all night then, Melissa started marching northward. But, but, Jennifer tried to think of something to break Melissa's iron will. But nothing came to mind. Forget it, I patted Jennifer's back. She decides things before thinking. You can't reason with that. All we can do is keep her out of trouble. I guess, Jennifer sighed and joined us. We made our way through the city's edge. The streets were illuminated by the strange stone that made the base of every building, saving the need for street lamps. We walked north until we got to the West City Bridge. The buildings gave way at the bridge, showing the open sky and all the stars it held. Wow! i never seen the stars so clearly, Jesse said in awe. Me neither, Jennifer said. Not without my power, at least. They're amazing. They're stars, Melissa said dismissively. A bunch of lights that don't do anything, except provide the means for global navigation and timekeeping, I noted, to which the majority of civilization would be impossible without. So you're saying the stars are the reason why we have to go to school every day and look at that ugly bastard Adrian? Melissa asked. In that case, fuck em. We all laughed at that. Jennifer spoke up. What about the boys? Some of them are really cute. Oh? Someone has a crush? Melissa smirked. Tell, tell, tell. No, it's not like that. Jennifer's skin started glowing under Melissa's demands. I just think some of the boys are cute. Like who? Jesse joined in. Well, that boy who sits in front of me. <laughs> Jerry? I laughed. That jerk? You like him? No, Jennifer said a bit too defensively just that he's cute. So who do you like? I said, officially joining in the teasing. It's not like that. Jennifer hid her face in glowing hands. I was about to tease another suggestion, 
when I was cut off by the roar of a motorcycle that passed us, not on the road, but on the walkway. The gale force threw us off balance into a pile. Well, well, a voice said behind us. What do we have here? A few little goilies lost in the city, a voice said in front of us. We got to our feet and looked behind us. A group of hooligans were blocking the way back. In front of us was only one guy, but he used his bike to block the path. Melissa yelled out, Who are you? You're better, the voice stepped forward. A girl with neon blue hair that seemed to hang wildly behind her. She and the rest of the group were wearing uniforms that were the same as my friends, except a dark shade of red instead of khaki. And I say, you have some nerve just waltzing into our turf. Turf? I said, looking her in the eye. You expect us to believe you're a gang or something? Or something, she stepped forward. See, here's the score. You're from West High. We're from North High. You don't come into the North without permission. Understand? Not a word, Melissa said before giving a rude gesture. Understand this? The leader scowled. You must be pretty powerful if you think you can backtalk me. Melissa crossed her arms. You must be pretty weak if you think backtalk is tough. You're going to regret that, the leader stepped forward, her wild hair starting to glow. Behind the other hooligans stepped up, cracking knuckles and wielding bats. I already regret looking at your ugly mug. Melissa took a step forward but was stopped by Jennifer. Wait, 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 Jennifer tried to calm the situation. This is a misunderstanding. We're freshmen. We didn't know there was turf or anything like that. Well, you're going to learn today, fresh meat. The biker behind us was walking towards us. His bulk overshadowed all of us together. No one talks to my bunny like that. Do you call her Bunny because she fucks like one? Melissa said back. No, Bunny yelled. I'm called Bunny because I bounce like one. She hopped 20 feet into the air before speeding into the ground in front of us. A shockwave pushed us all back. I heard Jessie scream. I looked up to see she was grabbed by the biker. Beg for forgiveness and I might be merciful. Bunny flipped her hair. Fuck you, Melissa shouted back. I'm not scared of you. But we are, Jennifer said, grabbing Melissa to hold her back. Please, just say you're sorry. Oh, that's not good enough, Biker said as he grabbed Melissa, hoisting her up. She said, beg. I suggest you get to it before I lose my patience and just throw you off. Melissa spat in his eye. He yelled in anger and tossed Jessie out of his other hand. Luckily, I was in the way to catch her. Unluckily, the force of the throw was not mundane. He didn't seem to gauge his incredible strength, because as my body stopped Jessie from ramming into the metal sidebar, her body slammed into mine with enough force to bend the metal, sending us both over into the river below. The river below was liquid darkness, denying me all my senses. I couldn't see or hear. I lost my direction and couldn't tell up from down. I was in a complete void until the river covered me in coldness. It drank away my body's warmth for itself. I didn't have long. Jessie was somewhere in the void with me. I could have sensed her if I wanted to. I only had to apply the knowledge given to me. I tried to feel around. She had been close to me. We fell so close together. She had been within arm's reach. I remember we were in a river. We were moving. She was moving. I used the knowledge and opened my senses. She was too far away, two arm lengths. We could have grabbed each other if we tried, but she was unconscious. The blow from hitting me was enough to knock her out. She couldn't fight against the current that was pulling us both deeper. I thought what to do. I couldn't fight for both of us. If I could, the river was stealing her warmth like it stole mine. The others knew we fell. Maybe someone would come, but would they get to us in time? As I drifted deeper into the water, I sensed Jessie already slipping away. I thought of the options I had. In the end, I had two. One was to flail around and hope someone came to save us before it was too late. That didn't seem likely, so I chose option two. I reached for the black book 